Podcasting from Singapore and broadcasting all around the world. You're listening to the Ignite EdTech Podcast with Craig Kemp, created by an educator for educators and streaming to the world. Now, over to your host, Craig Kemp. Hello and welcome to episode 122 of the Ignite EdTech Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Kemp, and I'm honored to have you join us. I continue to work with the incredibly talented Mark Quinn to improve the final audio quality of this podcast. He has his own podcast production studio that provides editing and mastering services to content creators. To connect with Mark, please see the details in the podcast notes below. A tool that has positively impacted the authentic and purposeful use of technology into classrooms and meeting rooms that I have worked in is Go Noodle. Go Noodle is a series of web-based videos, games, and activities focused on introducing short bursts of physical exercise into the classroom. For children of all ages who need to burn up energy to concentrate on learning, this is a simple solution. The site is meant to be used for physical activity in 5-10 to 10 minute bursts, particularly during transition periods as a brain break to learning. Teachers create a classroom mascot and students level it up by completing activity challenges. This mechanism is fun, but not the main incentive behind Go Noodle. What really stands out is the sheer variety of activities students can participate in. From dancing, to yoga, to Wii Sports type running games, there's a ton to do. There are also videos that incorporate academic subjects with movement, such as competition games, identifying plural nouns, or games where students use their whole body to form letters. There's a channel entirely in Spanish, and videos that are focused on mental health, Teachers can explore the featured videos on the main page or browse videos by category, such as movement type or academic subject. In addition, there are curricular resources that offer ideas for how to incorporate Go Noodle into your classroom, printables to enhance a lesson, and customizable quiz questions. Go Noodle is available on a variety of platforms, including iOS and Android tablets, as well as Apple TV and Roku. Versions on these other platforms include the videos, and the majority of Go Noodle's videos, but may not include some of the extracurricular aligned content. The best part is that Go Noodle education is now free for all educators, so jump on and explore. I highly recommend that you take a look at the link in the description below, gonoodle.com. Last week, I shared my thoughts about the World EduLead Summit and gave my highlights of the incredible event and my main sources of learning. If you're interested in learning more, Go back and listen to last week's episode. This week, I wanted to briefly chat about equitable recruitment and the way schools can be smarter about when, how, and who they recruit, following an amazing chat this week with Alan and Apana, which you're going to hear next. In our education recruitment world, we often hire the best people on paper, and occasionally we're shocked at who turns up. In a world that needs to be better at identifying an equitable workforce to support our increasingly diverse population of students, I believe we can use experts in our pockets, like Alan and Apana, as well as technology tools to support this process. If you're looking at equitable recruitment and being smarter about who you hire for the future of our educational institute, then start asking the right questions. Next up, in the interview with Alan and Apana, I ask and dive into these questions and I encourage you to think about your context and how these elements and the tech tools shared can support not only your recruitment of new staff, but the professional learning and development of teachers to best support learning in this space. To learn more, please connect and follow on your social channel of choice and don't hesitate to reach out with your thoughts and ideas. Every week, I bring you a short interview with some of my edu heroes an engaging learning experience with someone who makes a difference in education every day, with a particular focus or angle towards educational technology. This week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Alan Fan and Aparna Sundaram. Let's have a listen to the chat. Today, I have the honour of speaking with Aparna Sundaram and Alan Fan. Aparna and Alan are inspirational educators making waves and impact in schools globally. Individually, they lead and inspire, and together, they run the Diversity Collective. The Diversity Collective works to place exceptional leaders and educators in international schools globally. As a facilitator between educators and partner schools, committed to strengthening their leadership, Alan and Apana work to bridge the current diversity gap seen at schools around the world. 
Over the past few months, Alan, a partner, and I have built an incredible relationship, amplifying their work via EduSpark, and I'm thrilled to bring their voices to you today. A partner and Alan, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk about education and technology integration? Very much so. <laughs> Let's go. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your current roles and what inspires you to do what you do? Aparna, let's start with you. Sure. I'm the founding partner and the CEO of the Diversity Collective. And as you mentioned, it's an organization committed to placing incredible leaders and teachers from historically underrepresented groups in the schools around the world. My inspiration is based on both personal and professional experiences. I went through my nursery through 12th grade education without having a single teacher of color. And that was challenging as a young person who was developing her own sense of self and identity. Professionally, I've worked in places where DIJ has not been a priority. And I've worked in places where the commitment to these issues was real and sustained. And I've seen how students particularly benefit from schools who are committed to providing diverse teaching and leadership teams. The impact's palpable, and I really do this work always with students in mind. Yeah, I love it, Apana, and I love the story of where this comes from, because I think that story is something that's not told enough in the world that we live in as well, and not just from your context, but in many contexts globally. And we know this from our experience in international schools as well, how important those stories are. And we'll dive into some of that a little bit later on. Alan, what about yourself? I'd love to learn more about the work that you do. Sure. Uh, I am currently a head of school at North London Collegiate School in Ho Chi Minh City. I'm also the founder of the Diversity Collective. And what inspired me to do this work is uh, to create a fair and equitable world for historically marginalized groups in terms of recruitment and getting jobs in schools in general, especially uh, leadership roles. There has always been a barrier for BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus candidates getting these roles, and we want to change that. And I use myself as an example. While an adult, uh, I've been I've faced with a lot of discrimination along the way, and so to get where to where I am today, I had to face uh, a lot of that, uh, those barriers. And so uh, to create this website in order to provide opportunities for others to follow uh, follow follow my footsteps as well. Yeah, and and we're going to dive into this a little bit more as well because I think that you know these stories represent where you've come from and who you are today, but also the journey that's coming. And that's the part that I'm excited about sharing as well is how is this going to make an impact and a difference? Ellen, I'd love to start with you and hear a little bit about your educational journey and what got you to where you are today as an individual. Wow. Uh, so going back, I started out as a, a third grade teacher and then moved quickly into a middle school teacher. And I taught, I taught uh, math uh, mostly. And I did that in Washington, D.C., uh, actually in California first and then in Washington, D.C. And then I moved into being a counselor an assistant principal and a middle school principal for about 15 years. And now I'm the founding head of school. So as an Asian man, um, in general, we're not wanted as leaders or not seen as leaders, particularly in Asia. And this is uh, there's major discrimination in Asia and internalized racism in the culture. And so I am where I am today is to pave the way, way for others and to show that we are just as competent as our white counterparts to lead schools. My ethnic background has nothing to do with my competency, and unfortunately, that's seen differently in Asia. And I would just add that my cultural competency uh, would make me a better suited candidate than others, especially in Asia, being an Asian male in leading schools as well. And so my journey um, has taken a long route to where it is today, and it's taken about 22 years to for me to be a head of school. And my current school actually took a huge risk by doing that, by finding a head of school who is Asian in a, in school in Vietnam. And so I would say that you know, around the world, how many of us are there in Asia leading an Asian school would be, I might be the only one. If there were, uh, were others, if they're listening, please reach out to me. Yeah, it's a fantastic story, Alan. Apana, I'd love to hear your educational journey and what got you to where you are today. Sure. 
so I, t- I mentioned a little about my K through 12 experience where I realized representation or even the lack thereof mattered a lot to me. And I realized that even as a child and an adolescent. And then I moved across the country for college and had a completely different social experience. My college was one of the most diverse campuses in the country at the time, and it was in one of the most diverse cities. And I finally had a feeling of belonging that had eluded me for so long growing up as a South Asian in a fairly segregated Midwestern city. I continued to seek out diverse cities to study and work in after college. And I think I gravitated to education because I really saw teaching as an act of social justice. So whether I've been in a public school or a private school, um, whether I was in New York or California or Mexico, whether I was a teacher or a department chair or an administrator, I think I've always thought a lot about the critical lens and the strong sense of self that I, I want to help my students develop. And part of my professional journey, ironically, was that I had a family illness and it took me back to my beginnings in a sense. I found myself in a private school in a fairly segregated Midwestern city. And this time I was an educator rather than a student. And I noticed that the student body had diversified quite a bit in the 25 years or 20 years I'd been gone, but that wasn't the same for the school faculty and leadership. And then I realized this was true for many of the private schools or independent schools in the States. And I really threw myself into this work during the past decade. And I I wanted to help schools serve all their students to the best of their abilities. And that really meant prioritizing issues of diversity and equity and inclusion and And part of my journey, again, is just personal. I'm a mom of bicultural, biracial, multinational kids, and I want my boys to be seen, and I want them to have a sense of belonging at at any school they walk into. Yeah, and that's I I like that you've brought it back to that that personal connection as well, Apana, because, you know, when it comes down to it, as a parent myself, I see my daughter's growing up in Singapore here and the third culture kids, right? This is a very different living and learning environment. But what I love about what they get at their school is that they are immersed in culture and internationalism and diversity and that they have friends from every corner of the globe that I could not give to them if I was back in New Zealand or or my home country, right? And it's that diversity is what makes this such a special place. And I think going back to what we were talking about earlier on with being leaders in schools and looking at that diversity in schools, we almost need to frame our conversations around hiring, leadership, staffing, around what we want from our kids as well. You know, the idea of making sure we've got a diverse culture of educators to help educate a diverse culture of learners, I think, too. And they probably sound more American, right, than New Zealander, right, Craig? Absolutely. (laughs) They they really do. (laughs) They really do. This leads us nicely into where I want to go here um, around your areas of expertise in DEIJ. And as a topic, it's something that we need to do more in in our schools rather than surface level conversations to stop, listen, and take action. What should schools be doing to be better at supporting and integrating DEIJ work into their culture that's more authentic and purposeful? Alan, as a school leader, what are your thoughts on this? So for me, I think every school is different and has different challenges and it's on a different journey. So really the most important thing is a, a more of a self-reflection on the school. But one of my first thing I always make suggestion do is to do an audit for the school and then use that information and data to create action plan with the community and move it forward. Because there was a lot of anecdotal evidence, there are a lot of people saying things within the school parents, teachers, students, but until you do some kind of survey or some kind of uh, inclusivity a survey, belonging survey, and the independent schools actually does a really good job there, uh, on, on this area where they actually have, a, they call it an AIMS uh, um, survey, and they do look at uh, uh, inclusion uh, in the community and use that information to have be a conversation starter because it would be so easy to start doing something like that because otherwise you have nothing to work on 
but also another would be to look look at the look at the the language within the school as a community starting out with having a common language in the school and learning as a community as well because sometimes the word deij means something different for other people and in different situations as well and so defining that for your school is going to be really important but that doing that as a community rather than put from top down and from let's say deij coordinator or from somebody who is a head of school or assistant head of the school can help with that. The other suggestion would be to start with self uh, and reflect on where you are as an individual, because we all have different journeys and take them. Uh, we also take them one step at a time. You know, if you ask me about DEIJ, I'm a very different journey. Even though Ab and I talk a lot, for example, she and I are in very different journeys because she's in Mexico and I'm in Vietnam, and our context is. It's also very context-driven uh, and also context-dependent of where you want to have that conversation. But for me, really, the most uh, important piece is to be empathetic and forgiving when you make mistakes, because we all make mistakes. Even for someone like me who has a doctorate in DEI work, I will still make mistakes. But then do not use that as an excuse uh, time and time again going forward. And so going back to what should schools do is really start with an audit, a survey, uh, and also just a comment understanding. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Ellen. Apana, what would you add to that? Well, I, I like these two words you used in your question, actually, Craig, authentically and purposefully. I feel like that's the answer. If we were to approach this and, um, and to do it in an authentic, purposeful way, similarly to what Alan said, um, I think it would be honestly assessing where your school is at the particular moment, right? There's no need to jump on the DIJ bandwagon and hire a speaker right away or do a workshop or two. You know, as Alan said, it's not going to be the same approach for every school. And the school has to be able to be honest and open in order to assess where they are so that you know, like you're going to meet your students, your faculty, your, the, your families, where they are and where you need to be. So I think um, that's really important. As Alan even mentioned, there are a couple great tools out there that schools could choose from to do this audit or assessment. I think one of the best sources of information are your students yourself. So if you can create a safe space where your students can speak freely or you can do a, or they can be surveyed anonymously, they will often be your guiding light. Of course, as educators, we want to celebrate what we're doing well in our schools, but we also have to just realize that we may not be serving all our students equally. And and sometimes students from marginalized communities often have their social emotional needs unmet. So being able to hear from those kids about what they might need, what they want, what they wish for can really inspire um, those at the top, the administrators, the board members to to take this charge seriously. Right. And then I think one of the things Alan also mentioned is to do this work, I think purposefully takes some vision, but it's a sustained effort and it's a lot of work. And so it's okay if you don't get it right the first time around, whatever you might be thinking as someone who's leading this work um, of what right quote unquote might look like, you know, there's going to be bumps in the road, but having the endurance to, to, to sustain this work and as a community say this matters to us. The rewards are incredible, you know, but it might take a few years to get there and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, as I, as I said before, like, I mean, I really appreciate that what Auburn just said because it is a journey. And I also appreciate what she said about uh, the DEI work and SEL work interwoven together because uh, it is true that a lot of DEI issues and students of color their social emotional needs are not met because of issues that they're facing because of DEI, because of race, because of gender. And so I think that's really important to take that into consideration, their mental health as well. Yeah, I really love this conversation. So all of this coming together really highlights the amazing work that you both are doing in this space. Alan, I'd love to hear more about the Diversity Collective. How can listeners get involved and what should we be looking for in the future with this work? So, I mean, you mentioned uh, before, we are a recruitment agency to help place historically marginalized teachers and leaders into schools. We are also a consultancy uh, agency to work with schools on their DIJ journey and issues uh, within their schools. 
many schools want to do this work and feel paralyzed at uh, what to do. And what uh, we, that's what we're here for, to work alongside with them to advance DEI issues within their schools. And we will also meet with them where they are and help them move along. And so right now, what we are really want the listeners to do is sign up for our website and for schools to sign up so that we can match people uh, from the school and also from the candidates. And in the future, our biggest goal is for all schools to go through implicit bias and recruitment bias training before they go out to recruit. This is particularly important when they are hiring a leadership position, even and then even more ambitiously in the future as for us to train board members when they recruit for a head of school position. And because we think that once you have somebody in that position, it does have a huge impact and a cascading impact for the rest of the school community. And then we also ask, we ask that for schools to come back to us and look at onboarding and also retention. Now that you've hired the diverse candidates, how do you support them to have a sense of belonging within the organization? And they retain the talented educators that you've hired uh, right now. And so I think it's a, it's a long journey, but we are hoping that our recruitment agency and our consultancy agency will also help school move along the way. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got all the links to everything in the work that you do in the podcast notes below as well. So if you're listening, please click through uh, and connect with both Alan and Apana. Let's jump into some quick fire questions now. The first thing that comes to your mind and maybe a brief why. Apana, let's start with you. What's your favorite EdTech book or resource? Um, EdSearch. It has two of my favorite elements, research and quality journalism. Um, they have a lot of ed tech content, but overall, they're just a great source of information for educators, too. Amazing. And Ellen, what about for you? Uh, for me, there would be UDL and blended learning. Uh, this is really just about different uh, strategies for uh, tier strategies for learners within the classroom. But it's also the blended because right now there are a lot of blended learning that's taking place. And this is good for all learners, especially those who already struggle in class. Uh, in person. And if you actually do blended learning, uh, how, how do you take them into consideration as well? Brilliant. What's your go-to ed tech tool that the listeners need to try, Alan? Uh, for me, I love Headspace for mindfulness. Uh, I think it's really important for, for people to take a pause, um, reflect, and have a little bit of mindfulness within the within your day. So that thing is a great uh, one. The other one is Kahoot because it's just fun for kids and there's always a winner for kids. So I think, you know, those two, too. So one for yourself and one for the kids. So that's what I love. I love it. And what about for you, Apana? Well, I was thinking about this. Pear Deck was my go-to for creating engaging, interactive, accessible lessons. Um, but their company just launched a new learning tool called Giant Steps, which I would encourage your listeners to try. Um, Giant Steps is collaborative, inclusive. It's a program that kids love to use and are able to use it within the classroom as a practice tool. Um, but they get to make their own avatars. Um, I, I would say it beats Kahoot, Alan. <laughs> That's good. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try it myself. But, um, you know, they get to practice it at their own pace and they're learning at the same time. But I think um, what I love is that it's made by educators for educators. So it's relevant and practical and easy to use. I love it. And final question from me is, you know, I'm a big fan of practicing and habits and seeing and following people's journeys. What's one daily habit or practice that helps you enjoy progress and succeed in your career? Apana, let's start with you. Sure. So each morning I do about 10 sun salutations, 5A, 5B, and I try to meditate for about 15 to 20 minutes. And this really just wakes up my body, settles my mind, and really grounds me for whatever the day might bring. Brilliant. And Ellen, what about yourself? Uh, for me, uh, I do a meditation also, but I actually just do it in the middle of the day. So when I'm having a really tough moment or situation, I just pause, meditate even for five minutes and just uh, reflect and make sure that you remain calm or whatever you need to do just so that uh, you are going forward with that. And the other thing I do is actually I read the Good News Network, which is I subscribe to, to get a daily uh, dose of positivity because it ranges from people doing good 
uh, in the world. And so it's always good to read that. Amazing. All of the links that we've talked about are in the podcast notes below. Inspirational, Alan and Apana. And I know the listeners are going to want to follow and connect with you. What's the best way for them to do that? Maybe you first, Alan, and, and then you, Apana. Uh, so I'm on Twitter. So it's tweet Alan Fan, pretty easy. And the other way is just to email me uh, at uh, alan at diversifair.org. And the other one is you can also just go to our website. And then if you sign up uh, in there and write us a, send us a question, we'll respond back to you. Yeah, I think definitely you can find us on, um, as Alan mentioned, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can follow the Diversity Collective. I'm also on LinkedIn at Operna Sundaram. And my email is operna at diversityfair.org. So we're very excited to connect with any of your listeners out there. <laughs> inspirational today, Alan and Apana. Thank you both so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. Next week, join me for episode 123 of the Ignite EdTech podcast when I'm joined by Nikki Hambleton. If you enjoyed today's episode, please follow us and share the podcast with your PLN and colleagues. Please remember to spend a few minutes to rate this podcast too on your podcast channel of choice so we can reach even more educators and edtech enthusiasts globally. Remember, you have the chance to win as well. Check out the links in the description for more and I'll see you again next week. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss another episode and be in the drawing to win prizes every week. If you know others that would enjoy the show, please hit that share button and brighten their day. Join us again next week for your weekly EdTech hit with at Mr. Kemp NZ. We'll see you again soon.